So, yeah, I, this is the title of my talk. It's Puffed Up or Filled Up? Um, and just to give you guys some context right off the bat, it's talking about pride, basically, um, pride and ego. So um, before I really get into it, I have some initial questions that you just need to consider or I'd like you to consider just in the beginning so that we can think about um, some application later on. So how, does, uh, how do you respond to feedback? And how do you respond to people's opinion of you? And those are kind of just have them mulling in the back of your, your back of your mind uh, as we as we continue. Um, and then those are more just for your personal reflection. We're not going to really like talk about it, so don't worry. Um, all right. So about me, I'm from Jericho, Vermont. A lot of people probably I've met a lot of people that don't know where Vermont is, but that's the United States. <laughs> so within the context of the United States, at least you should be able to figure out that that red thing is Vermont. And then so like we're like right here and then I live here so if you zoom in that other red dot is my town that's Jericho Vermont um, so that's very near and dear to my heart I love Jericho I'm super into Vermont um, so much so that we have a whole slide dedicated to things about Vermont so can someone tell me what that is and no one from Vermont or that I told gets to say <laughs> what would you what would you call it okay and I okay yep so that's true Saucers. 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 So, okay, so you might think that you're wrong, in, <laughs> but it's called a creamy. In Vermont, this is actually specifically a maple flavored creamy because we love Vermont maple. So for the purposes of this evening, anytime that you want to refer to this object, please call it a creamy for the next like 35 minutes. <laughs> okay, also uh, we like Ben and Jerry's <laughs> a lot. We, we uh, started Ben and Jerry's, basically. I, if I was in a food, I would be Ben and Jerry's. Um, and then there's a pronunciation guide. We don't use T's. Apparently, this is also a New England thing. But I'm from Vermont, so I just know it as a Vermont thing. So that's not Milton. It's Milton. Um, that's not Vermont. It's Vermont. There's no, like, I don't ever pronounce the T at the end of Vermont. And then if you're really hardcore, like a seventh generation Vermonter, then you'd say Huntington. <laughs> and I've heard people say that in real life, and I'm like, what? Because that's just two towns away from me, and I, so I know Hun Huntington. I, I'm not that hardcore. I pronounce the second T, so I say Huntington, <laughs> not Huntington, which is, anyways. So that's some funny things about me from Vermont. But, um, so this is kind of some photos that sum up me. I'm aerospace engineer. I'm a senior, obviously. I've been here for four years. Um, this is me skiing with some of my buddies. Um, that, us, actually, so my group, Jacob Swain's in this photo, there he is, um, are singing the national anthem at Fenway right now, which is kind of cool, so shout out to them. Um, but like, and then there's a guidance counselor for all of these missiles, which is super funny, <laughs> if you know how to code uh, guidance law. Um, so some of us. And then airsoft and stuff. So I hope I don't get in trouble for that photo. Those aren't real. Don't worry about it. Um, but those are, and I like adventurous things. So that's kind of just some context about things that I like. So if you want to go hiking ever, hit me up. I'm free. Like, I have one class. So <laughs> like, just, just text me. Um, and this is my family. All of us in one picture, pretty much. Um, and so yeah, two of them are here. That's my mom and dad, Chuck and Katie Griffin. Uh, they love me a lot. And I love them back. And they're both engineers, and they both are Christians. So pretty much from like day one, I, my path was, my destiny was set. <laughs> because with two parents that are both Christian and both engineers, there's no way that I was not going to end up as an engineer. So, um, or a Christian, for that matter, ideally, uh, which is true. So, and then that's my brother. Uh, he's such a goober. And then that's my sister. <laughs> She's pregnant. She's going to have a baby like right when I graduate. So that's very exciting. Um, yeah, and so those are just, that's like really basic information about me. And then there's two stories that I'm going to tell you right now um, to kind of give you some context about uh, who I am and what God's been doing in my life since, I guess, the beginning of my life so, and before. Um, but the first, of, the first one is um, I have scoliosis, which means that my spine is like slightly S-shaped. And so instead of wearing, like I had a back brace basically, and it was like a corset. Um, do you guys know what a corset it is? It's like women in London would wear them um, back in the day. <laughs> and so um, that's not what a teenage boy wants to do. Like that was very uncomfortable. I didn't like it. I felt self-conscious about it. Um, but what it did train me and what God was using it for, I think, was um, just uh, dealing with perseverance and like tenacity and stuff uh, and having that dedication to anything uh, kind of really makes you um, mature and complete, uh, which yeah, 
brings me to this verse. This is unrelated to the rest of my talk, but it's one of my favorite verses. Um, James 1, 2 through 4, and it's, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so I see that uh, trial, which lasted, that was like 10 years I had to wear that for 19 hours a day, so that was kind of, that was the worst, honestly. Um, <laughs> but uh, I see it as kind of like God's hand wrapped around my life from my whole childhood. Uh, and that is, that's been one of the really tremendous growth experiences that um, God has provided me over the years. And then the other one is um, a little bit more uh, tragic, actually. So uh, my best friend, Elijah Davis, um, was in a car accident one month before I came to WPI and he died. Uh, and so that was really tough for me um, and for my whole community because we had, um, like, I, I didn't really know what to do with that. And I figure there's either, you're either going to get closer to God during a time of tragedy or, or misplace your confusion and, and get farther away. And for me, I got much closer to God. He used it as a time of um, intense growth and reliance on the Christian community in my town, uh, which was really awesome. Uh, and I saw a lot of good things that came out of it. And specifically for my life, um, I kind of had this awakening that my, in, in uh, my high school years, I was pretty plateaued in my spiritual life. Like I, I, I understood intellectually I was growing a lot in terms of uh, scriptures and knowing the word and things, but I didn't really have that personal relationship with God and that kind of awoke, that I alerted me to that need, that I did need a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, and so Elijah's Christian, I know I'll see him again in heaven. Um, it doesn't bother me to talk about it anymore because it's been four years basically and you don't get over it, but it doesn't like immediately cause me pain anymore on the day to day. So that's cool. So if you ever have to want to talk about stuff like that, please let me know. Um, but yeah, so like things that God was trying to get a hold of me for at that time. And then when I turned 20, I kind of rededicated my life to God. I'm, my body was pretty much done growing. I'm really tall, fortunately, so I'm done. Um, but my mind is still developing. And so reading my Bible every day is really important. And um, I figured like getting into these habits that I want for the rest of my life I need to start now. And so I would urge you, if you're questioning that, to definitely look into that. And also, this is my gospel message too. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, really seriously consider that because that has been tremendously helpful for me and for a lot of the people, guys and the girls in this room. Um, I know, and it's, it's really the only way that I would ever choose to live. So um, that's just a mini message too. But, so back to the things that we're actually gonna talk about this evening, which is um, 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, the end, the tail end of 3, and the first couple of verses of 4, right? So I already said we're going to talk about pride and ego, and those were some of the things that God was telling me. He's like, hey, I want to work on this area of your life. Uh, so we're first we're going to explore the problem, uh, what are our egos like, then we're going to look at the cure, or the solution really to the problem, and then finally um, the application. So what's one, I have one single action that you guys can do uh, that will, like, what's up? Um, that will like, you only have to remember one thing when you leave, and that's the one thing at the end, so you should remember. Uh, so to illustrate just kind of, I, I love storytelling, I tell stories all the time, I think it's great, so I have a story here um, to illustrate this first point about the problem. Uh, I'm in, I already said I'm in Sound Logic, right, and so we're singers, and so we had a gig last year, and we went and we sang and we sounded good, and then we went to go talk to the people afterwards, and all these people were coming up and they were saying, oh, that sounded so great, that's awesome. And then eventually this one dude came up and he said, oh, uh, you know, I, I think you were a little pitchy on that second song. I think you probably could have sung it a little better. And that's all he said. And he left, and so we were like, okay. Um, and then more people came up and they said good things, and so I felt pretty good still. But a lot of, there was like a, there was a psyche change in the group where a lot of us started fixating on this one idea that somebody had something, said something negative about us, that they had criticized us. Um, and so people started getting really down and kind of the whole evening was slight, kind of ruined, right? Because we thought, I mean, I thought we sang really well and we did, like we did a good job. The, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive, but just because one guy had said one thing, our whole group was, that was all we were talking about. We were just fixated on this one idea that there was negative feedback about us. And I couldn't really, like, I don't like that. I'm a very positive person, so I don't like it when my buddies are bummed. And so I, provided to them what I thought was wisdom at the time, which was this. 
Um, be true to yourself. Set your own standards. Don't let anyone else's standards bother you. And so I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense, right? We hear that all the time. And if you think about it, that's like very Disney. <laughs> like Elsa, it just told us to let it go. We're like, let it go, slam the, uh, slam the door and turn, slam the door, whatever. Slam the door. <laughs> and so, like, that's what we hear all the time, and we're just constantly inundated with this feeling of like, it doesn't matter what other people think about you, don't worry if they don't like it, because all that matters is your perception of yourself. Just have, you know, like have some self-esteem, you know? And we hear that a lot, um, oftentimes f from everyone, I would say. That's a pretty common message. So. I was thinking about it, and, I, and that didn't bother me to say that at the time. And then uh, last year, I heard a message that I, made, I based this message off of, actually. And it kind of addressed the issue of pride. And so it first fielded this question, which does that type of wisdom solve the problem that we had? Which we were fixated on this idea of neg negative uh, feedback. We had been criticized. And instead of having a fun night where we just kind of were like, OK, like good and bad, that's fine. Um, people couldn't get over this idea that we hadn't been perfect, like we hadn't done something that was really fabulous. So, do we need to have a higher opinion of ourselves in order to have um, that not be an issue? And I would argue that, that that's no. That's just not how, it doesn't work. Um, so basically, this is something that I struggle with. I haven't really, I never considered this growing up um, until I heard this message and then I started thinking about it and being like, wow, I really resonate with a lot of the ideas that he's saying. Like, I constantly am thinking about how people perceive me and if they like me or if they think I'm funny or if my jokes are good or like how smart am I, how good a Christian am I, and all of these different ideas. And to some degree, that consumes my thought life. It's like in the back of my mind, constantly working. Um, and, I, and it's also like a little bit painful because of just the vir by virtue of the fact that I feel like people are judging me sometimes. And so I'm kind of curious. You don't have to answer anything, but I'm going to field these questions about you guys. Do you ever think about that? Um, does like someone walking by say an offhand comment to you and you're like, wow, that was really rude. I can't believe they just said that. And then you just, that's all you can think about. Like you might be out and the rest of the day, all you're thinking about is like, I can't believe they didn't like my shoes. Or like <laughs> they, or someone calls into question your character or something. And then does that like swirl around in your mind? And I hope that at least for some of you that's resonating because that's what we're talking about. Um, so, and the good thing is like, other people seem to have experienced this issue. So, we're going to look at what Madonna says about it. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what you think about Madonna, because we're just looking at this one quote, and then we're leaving her behind. So, sorry, sorry Madonna. But, um, does someone want to read it? Josh. My drive in life comes from a fear of being mediocre. This is always pushing me. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human, but human being, but then I feel I am still mediocre and uninteresting unless I do something else. Because even though I have become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and I guess it never will. Hmm. All right, so I think she defines what we're talking about with a sense of clarity um, and really self-awareness, I would say, that probably I definitely don't have and maybe you guys don't have either. Where she just says that that pride issue of like needing to be somebody and needing to uh, have like that constant search for the next step uh, is something that's insatiable. Like she can never get over it. She's always even, and she foresees that happening for the rest of her life. She's just accepted that that's the way it's going to be. All right. So think about that on the one hand, okay, and just keep that in your mind for a second. Um, we're going to look at another example. This is Harold Abraham. Um, he's a famous sprinter. The movie Chariots of Fire is based off of his life. Um, and he said this, so does someone want to, he's talking about sprinting in this quote, so does someone want to read that? Yeah. Uh, in one hour's time, I will be out there again. I will raise my eyes and look down that corridor, four feet wide with ten lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. But will I? Mm. Yeah. So, this kind of demonstrates, I think, the other side of that same coin, where you've got, on the one hand, super inflated pride, 
Okay? And then on what he's now demonstrating is that you have this kind of self-doubt and uh, questioning of your image, this need to justify your existence, and questioning like, can I actually justify my existence? Can I do this? Um, and having that, that struggle. And so that's uh, kind of two different sides of the same thing. And they're similar in this one way, which is both of those viewpoints look inward on yourself, right? So the pride is like, oh, I need to turn in and make sure that my ego is big enough so that I can be awesome, okay? And then the other one is self-doubt, which is constantly measuring yourself against other people or against like great men in the past or women, great men or women in the past. Um, and so b those both being similar, I was thinking about especially this quote um, as I was entering college, you know? It's, I, I feel like this a lot. I feel like my life is a performance and that you constantly have to perform. I'm performing grade-wise for school, performing for my parents. I'm actually performing because I like theater, so like, that's kind of funny. Um, but like, athletically, people, athletes perform. Um, I, don't think it's, I don't think anyone's exempt, including you guys. Um, so I ask you if, you, if you feel like your life is a performance, I hope it's resonating with some of you. Uh, the, the good news, about it being so universal and such such a you know monumental struggle that people have with have is that Paul also had these feelings so we don't have to just like question oh that, like that's unfortunate man I really did struggle with pride that's too bad um, this is really we're gonna start getting into the actual scripture here uh, this evening so just some background for you is it's written by Paul to the church in Corinth and they had this like flashy message that they were starting to go with um, that Apollos, who was this other guy, we don't know a lot about him, I don't think, um, was telling them. And so they were kind of starting to stray from the truth of the humility and the servanthood that a Christ-like example um, is what we've really been, we're trying to emulate in the church, right? And I imagine that since we're dealing with pride and we've kind of gone over some of the symptoms of pride that this isn't biblically sound necessarily, by the way, but I imagine that the church kind of responded to Paul's letter with a feeling of like, what does he know about the church? Like, he spent more time in jail in the past couple of years than he spent out of jail. So what does he know about the church? Why can we even say, like, why should we listen to him? And kind of, he'd, they'd get angry at him like we got angry at that guy who had given us some criticism. And so that's kind of what I imagine they were doing. And so before we get into the actual scripture, I just want to remind you, so, we are, so we're currently exploring the problem and what our egos are like, and then we're going to find the cure and how do we get it. So um, can, two, can one person, there's, two, there's four slides that have the scripture on it. Um, can one person read the first two and somebody else read the second two? Cool, first two. Um, so then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges. Okay, and somebody else? Therefore, I judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will explore the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of the one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What did you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if though you did not? Alrighty. So that, I don't know if you guys caught it, because that, that was a lot. But the, basically what he's saying, the issue is pride. So if we're looking at the text, right, and we see in verse 21 of chapter 3, it says, no more boasting about men. He just flat out tells them, he says, stop talking about which one of us you're following, either it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas um, or any of the other guys. And so then in verse 7 he says, why do you boast? 
because it's kind of ridiculous. Everything that you have is from God, so you don't really have any right to boast about anything. And then in verse 6, he urges them not to be puffed up. Just remember the title, Puffed Up or Filled Up. We're going to get to the filled up in a little bit, but this is the puffed up that we're talking about now. Um, in one man over against another, right? And so to get into the idea of this, we're going to look at the actual Greek word, which is physio, uh, which is a strange word because usually we all know the, the word hubris. Um, that's the common word for pride, and that's what's typically used in the Bible. But this one, physio, is um, used seven times just by Paul in this book and in 2 Corinthians. And yeah, it means overinflated, swollen, distended beyond its proper size, and it's related to the word for bellows. So like when you're forging iron or steel or whatever, you have a bellows and that basically forces air into stuff, right? So what is that, why is Paul doing that? Why is he using that word instead of hubris? And I think the reason for that is because overinflated and swollen is all of these kind of like grotesque images, right? That like kind of make you think about an organ like, it, like an organ that's super full and kind of like ready to burst and is painful and ugly. Um, so for instance, if you were walking along and you stub your toe, like I mean, I mean like not just stub it, like oh ouch, that ah, unfortunate, like you really bust it on um, like a brick wall or something. And if you then look at it, it starts swelling up immediately, right? And it kind of, it hurts and you can't get over it, and every time you take a step, you're like, oh, my toe, oh, wow, and then the next step, oh, my toe, and you put on your shoe, and your shoe feels tight, okay? And so I think that's what Paul is trying to draw attention to, is that our pride is just like that, where if it's so puffed up that it's just constantly on your mind, like the toe, every time you take a step, it's on your mind, right? And so, like, your thought life is kind of just consumed either with your toe and, and then therefore with your pride. And I think that's what he's saying. And that's why he kind of has this idea, he uses this special word um, that means to have it be swollen or distended, which is kind of a, I just, I kind of cringe when I hear that word, it's kind of nasty. And it also hurts too, right? Like when you stub your toe, it hurts a lot. And that's indicative that something is wrong, right? And I think pain, and this is true for all pain, I think points to something greater or that something is broken and needs to be fixed. And so going around with your ego, like being so puffed up, it, it kind of hurts. On the day-to-day -day basis, I have this, I feel like, not necessarily that I'm judged every day, but it's hard to go out, go a day without, and I don't know if you guys feel this as well, but it's kind of hard to go a day without uh, feeling like, oh, if I didn't do any work today, then I'm lazy, and that kind of, I internalize that, and I judge myself because I have standards, right? Or maybe you go by and you think about, like, whether or not people think that you're cool or you're attractive or, like, any of these other things that you can be judged on. And that's painful. It's, it's exhausting. Like, you could feel ignored um, or criticized, and we let ourselves down sometimes. And putting that pressure on yourself is just tiring, right? So that... Is the, that's the problem, essentially, is that, that we're trying to deal with. And Billy Graham states it this way. Uh, he says, anxiety is the natural result of when our hope centers on anything short of God and his will for us. Okay, so basically, that's an, just another way of saying it. Um, and I defined it like this, saying we're searching for something that will make us feel valuable, to give us identity, to provide us with self-worth, and our egos get inflated. They, get, they turn into these big balloons full of hot air, and it's painful, and there's, but there's nothing really in there, right? Like you don't really feel, like Madonna said, there's nothing really in there. She, she constantly tries to put something in, and it's not enough, right? It's never big enough to fill that hole, and sometimes maybe you feel like, oh, I've, put so like I've done something amazing, so you put that into the balloon, and your ego feels really big and full, and then it rattles around and, and kind of shakes out, right? Um, and that space, I think, is meant for God. So that's the problem. One point down, all right? One point down. We're, all, we're getting there, guys. Don't worry. Um, we spent a lot of time defining what it is, and now that we have this, uh, let's, let's go to the solution, right? Okay. So is this the solution? Do we, we've got, we, should we just think about other people more? Do we need to, we, I've got all this pride and it hurts, so maybe I'll just have less pride, okay? Okay, so I'll have a lower self-esteem, okay? I'll think less of myself, okay? And, wow, now I'm really depressed. <laughs> yeah, yikes. Okay, so, but, okay, so now, 
uh, come on, Elsa's telling me to just let it go and have all this pride again. But now I'm back in the same bubble where I, everything hurts and I'm constantly on the defense, right? And everything, everything just feels like I'm being judged constantly. So do you see the dichotomy here of like you can either try and deflate the balloon by having low self-esteem and no pride and that'll solve the problem, but then it doesn't because you just feel trapped on either end of this spectrum. So how do we, how do we get over this? All right, so let's look, at, let's look at Paul's example here again. And we're going to look at another fancy Greek word. I don't know how to spell this one, but that's the phonetic pronunciation. And it means to judge, and so it's anacarinal. Um, and so if we look at verse 3, it says, But with me it is a very small thing that uh, I should be judged by you or by any human court. And so the word anacarinal, again, is only used ten times. Um, just by Paul and just in this uh, letter, okay? So why is he using this word instead of another word that means to judge? And as you can see, it doesn't mean like judge like a criminal court of law or anything. It means judge whether or not something is legit. So if something gets your stamp of approval, that would be Anna Carino. If something has credentials that are authentic, that would be legit. Uh, and so that is really what it means to have this. And so if you look at the verse, it says, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be proven legit by you or by any human court. So he's not looking to the other people around him for his sense of, his sense of value or his, his self-worth, really. I care little if you judge me. I care little if anyone judge me. And then he takes it one step further and says, I don't even care what I think about me. And so, well, that's kind of weird. Like, does it, does it matter what, what I think about me? That's kind of strange. And then he just looks in verse 4. This is, we're getting to the actual solution here, which it says, it is the Lord who judges me. Okay? So, he's looking to God for his sense of legitness. His stamp of approval doesn't come from the people around him. It comes from God. So, perfect. We found the solution, right? Look to God for your stamp of approval. Let God judge you and provide your identity and your value. And that is the solution. But that doesn't say anything about how to get it. Okay, so that's, this is the third point now. We found the solution. Um, it is to look to God for your identity. But we still need to look at Paul's example. Um, and there's still this question of, isn't that still performance-based? Like, sure, now God is judging me instead of people, but it's still... I'm bringing God this, my actions, and he's going to judge me one way or the other, and like, am I legit or am I not? Okay. And the key to that, I think, is in verse 4, which says, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Okay? And if you think about that, this is really the key uh, to what we need to learn from Paul. All right? My conscience is clear. So what does that actually mean? He, he doesn't feel bad about what he's done. Like, so his relationship with God is square. Okay? So he knows that his actions... He's not a perfect man by any means. He says, I'm the chief of sinners um, somewhere else. I don't remember where. Where does he say that? Anyways, he says it somewhere in the Bible. Just trust me. Uh, we've all, we, we know that verse. The, I, I'm the chief of sinners. And he doesn't say, I was the chief of sinners. He says, I am the chief of sinners. So even while he's still writing this... His conscience is clear, even though he's still sinning. So his actions, right, are acceptable in the sight of God. But that is not what makes him innocent. And so this innocent word mean, also means acquitted or um, justified, right? And so justified in the New Testament typically is associated with salvation. So his actions, essentially, are not what makes him justified, was not, are not what saves him. And that is really, really, really what we need to learn from this passage right here, okay? It says, it's saying that his behavior, whether it's good or bad, okay, is not linked to his identity, all right? Does that, does that make sense? So his behavior isn't linked to his identity. And that's a crazy idea. That is go, that's counterintuitive to what the world is telling us in every way, that your actions and your accomplishments and your sins aren't linked to your identity, in any way, that's amazing because that frees us, that really gives us the gospel-like humility, I think, of what we're trying to achieve, okay? 
And so in that, um, that really lies, that's the application that we need to, to seek. Okay, so we're, our egos are puffed up and Paul is being filled up. And that is where, so that's where the title of the message comes from. But it also is dem, uh, demonstrative of us looking at this scale of having too much pride or having too little pride, and that's, that's not it. You just get away from that. And it's not having more self-esteem, it's not having less self-esteem, it's just esteeming of oneself less. And that is what Paul is doing. And so that's kind of a, that's a, that's a weird statement, right? Esteeming oneself less. And basically, that doesn't, that's not to say, think less of yourself. I'm not telling you to go down to the second option, right? Don't do that. That's bad. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of um, courage and power and confidence that comes with being a child of Christ and having your identity centered in looking, having God judge you instead of people. Um, so don't do that. Just, it's esteeming oneself less. Okay? And so just looking finally um, at verse 7, what do you have that you did not receive? This again is just saying like, everything you have is from God, whether it's talents or uh, like ability or wealth or anything. Everything you have is from God. So why, you can't boast. You already have everything you want. And that's referring, I think, and what you need. That's referring to Jesus. Like we have salvation if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, okay? So we don't need anything else. And our identity is founded on Jesus giving us that stamp of approval, Jesus giving us that legitness, okay? And that is such a beautiful thing because it frees us to have this humility that we can have in Christ, but it also gives us the confidence to go around and not be um, entering this courtroom that Paul is talking about. Like, Jesus says that you are worth it, and 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 that's amazing. And then he goes on and says, you don't even need to do, like, you don't even need to go in there. Don't even think about being judged by other people. Just think, in terms of duration of like what your thought life is thinking and pondering and dwelling on, don't go there. Just think about Jesus more. So, the final and one applicable action that I'm going to end with right now is think of yourself less and think of Jesus more. So much, of your, so much of our actions and attitudes and things come from what we think about um, and our thought life. And so I think what Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians and what he's trying to tell us and what we should get out of this is that if we think on Jesus more, at least more, if not greatly more, than we think of ourselves in terms of duration, like if you're dwelling on Jesus, then this issue of pride uh, whether you should be too, too, you can be too proud or, or not proud enough kind of is just, it's transient, all right? And that is really what I want to leave us with. And I don't say that you shouldn't think about yourself because self-reflection is important, um, but thinking about Jesus more is really critical to solve this issue. So that's the one option, the one action that I want you guys to remember. Um, and I'm going to end with this verse. Uh, because you can't just not think about something, you have to replace it with something else. Um, so finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And so I urge you, just again, to think of yourself less and think on these things that are described here more and think on Jesus more. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to pray us out and then I think worship team has um, one more song. So, um, Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you um, for sharing your word, Lord. I pray that anything that I said that wasn't of you would be forgotten and that um, the message of root having our identities uh, rooted in Christ and how that allows us to be humble but also courageous um, like Joshua, I pray that that message would stick with us um, for these coming weeks, especially in the Easter season, Lord. Uh, please be with us as we head into the second half of D-Term. Um, we worship you. We love you. Thank you so much for just providing this fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen.